first we will study about the governor general of bengal so warren hastings was first i mean prominent and uh, he was also the first governor general of bengal right so he was uh, in the position of governor general of bengal uh, from 1772 to 85 so we can say it is a very long considerably long period of time good evening students welcome back to clue to says right so till yesterday we have completed 65 topics in our 95 days prelims challenge so with this we have we can say completed two third of the decided topics so still uh, broadly we will be covering in the coming days 30 to 35 topics so with that we will be having 95 to 100 topics in our hand with respect to prelims right so i hope along with this uh, whatever the discussions we are making apart from that your own preparation especially in the current affairs and uh, maybe the basic ncert books and other with the other preparation uh, majorly what are the topics we have uh, left here in this uh, challenge so uh, try to read them also try to cover them also so with all these things in hand Uh, i believe i hope you will be in a better better position to uh, appear in the exam right and i hope that with combined if you combined all these resources uh, the 95 days prelims topics the current affairs and other uh, topics from the general studies itself you are going to prepare you will be in a good position to appear in the exam and uh, hopefully uh, you uh, hope hopefully i believe that you will uh, clear the examination right so today uh, is our 66th day and we are going to study up today the governor general governors general and vice royce of india so with this we will be uh, we are uh, we have come into the modern india topics and here broadly we are going to see the three topics so in that first topic is governors general of india and vice royce of india so because we are uh, discussing list topics uh, i am approaching the chronology uh, chronological approach i am taking the chronological approach i am discussing the governor general and the vice roy in a chronological order so when you know some details about the governor's general that too in a chronological order you will be in a position to eliminate some options in the questions and you will be in a position to arrive at a conclusion about the answer especially in the prelims examination <coughs> apart from that a uh, few years back there was a question in mains also about a particular governor general uh, the question uh, regarding how that governor general is or uh, can be considered as a uh, modern i mean beginner of the modernization of india so like that there was a specific question there was a question specifically on the Uh, we can say initiatives taken by a particular governor general so in that way uh, you may get a question in the mains also on a particular governor general and what are the important developments uh, happened during that particular develop uh, particular governor general uh, here i am also discussing uh, i am only discussing a prominent governor general and vice roy because whenever the examiner chooses to ask a question from this topic he will also i mean mo- mostly he will tend to ask uh, from the prominent governors general only so because of that i am covering only prominent governors general and vice roy right so before going uh, and uh, going into the topic and discussing the individual governors general uh, briefly we will know about what is meant by governors general what is meant by vice roy and uh, how the position of the governors general has evolved right we will see briefly those aspects and after that we will discuss about individual governors general and vice roy so initially uh, there were governor initially there was a governor of bengal so you know very well when british uh, britishers came to india and they were trying to establish their power in india so they uh, they concentrated their efforts in three prominent places 
वन इज इन बंगाल वन इज इन बंगाल सेकेंड वन इज इन मद्रास राइट नेक्स्ट सेंटर इज एट मुंबई और वी ऑल्सो कॉल दम एज बॉम्बे सो ब्रिटिशर्स बेसिकली कॉन्सेंट्रेटेड देयर एफर्ट्स और वी वी कैन से लाइक दिस वी हैव सीन द राइज ऑफ ब्रिटिशर्स एस्पेशली फ्रॉम दीज थ्री सेंटर्स बॉम्बे मद्रास एंड बंगाल और कोलकाता सो इन द बिगिनिंग बिगिनिंग स्टेजेस ऑल दी गवर्नर्स आई मीन द ब्रिटिश ऑफिसर्स गवर्नर्स वर अपॉइंटेड बाय द ईस्ट इंडिया कंपनी टू लिक लुक इन टू अफेयर्स एट दीज प्लेसेस दीज थ्री प्लेसेस राइट सो दे वर इनिशियली दे वर एक्टिंग इंडिपेंडेंटली इंडिपेंडेंटली दे वर नॉट डिपेंडेंट और दे वर नॉट अंडर एनी अदर गवर्नर ऑफ एनी अदर प्लेस आई मीन आई एम डिस्कसिंग इन दी कॉन्टेक्स्ट ऑफ थ्री दीज थ्री गवर्नर्स गवर्नर्स इन दीज थ्री प्लेसेस सो इनिशियली फॉर बंगाल और कोलकाता देर वॉज ए गवर्नर ऑफ बंगाल आल्सो so what happened uh, with the uh, coming up of uh, regulation act 1773 is the governor of bengal he has been designated as governor general of bengal governor general of bengal right so somewhat his position has been increased and the rest of the two governors governor of bombay and the governor of uh, madras they have been made accountable to governor general of bengal only in few matters like matters of war so if a east india company at this place want to wage a war against a native ruler uh, i mean they should have the approval of the governor general ro so somewhat the uh, governor of bengal sorry governor of madras and governor of bombay they have been made uh they have brought under some control of the governor of uh, governor general of bengal so that is the change so whatever the governor generals of the uh, i mean some prominent governor generals of bengal are there we will study about them right so initially if you see the governor of bengal robert clive was the prominent figure robert clive you know very well he is a uh, uh, well associated with battle of plassey which laid the actual foundation for the expansion or we can say beginning of the colonial rule so robert clive is well known as the governor of bengal after that uh, governor of governor general uh, of bengal position has started with the regulating after act of 1773 warren hastings was the first uh, governor general of bengal right so this had some authority over presidencies of the uh, bombay and madras next came governor general of india so this has happened uh, with the change in the charter act of 1833 so effectively uh, during that time only the capital uh, has been uh, shifted from bengal or kolkata to delhi so the change subsequently the name of the governor general has also changed from governor general of bengal to governor general of india right so william bentick was uh, first to hold this title governor general of india next <coughs> uh, came the viceroy of india so after the 1857 revolt the we you know very well uh, british i uh, india directly went under the control of the british crown and uh, uh the position of the governor general also changed when he was dealing with the uh, i mean the governor general of india position was also there and the viceroy title has been additionally added so the same person was holding the uh two we can say titles viceroy and the governor general of india so whenever the uh, governor general interacting with the princely states the native uh, i mean areas ruled by native ruler native rulers those were effectively called as the princely states so when he was the governor general was interacting uh with them he's he was known as viceroy and uh, when he was acting 
on the territories that are occupied or under the control of the British crown, uh, then he was known as the normal name that is Governor General of India. So, the literal meaning of Viceroy is uh, signifying that a person who exercises power on behalf of a monarch. That is the literal meaning of monarch. Sorry, Viceroy. Right. So, this is a brief introduction about the uh, the terminology, changing terminology, right. So, there was, uh, effectively, there was only one Indian Governor General, rest of the Governor Generals or Viceroy's, all the all of them are, all of them were only Britishers. So, see Rajagopala, uh, Rajagopala Chari, uh, after the, uh, I mean, occurrence of independence, once India has achieved independence, uh, <coughs> See Rajagopala Chari appointed as the Governor General after uh, he was Governor General, uh, uh, right? He was Governor General till India declared as a republic in 1950, once uh, immediately after the constitution has been adopted. So, that position also, the position of the Governor General was also a ceremonial position. Uh, the actual power was in the uh, Prime Minister or the Cabinet, uh, Cabinet which is headed by Prime Minister, right. This is about, this is a brief introduction about the, all the titles. Now we will see individual Governors, Governor Generals of Bengal and Governor General of India, right. So first, govern, uh, first we will study about the Governors General of Bengal. So Warren Hastings was first, I mean, prominent and uh, he was also the first Governor General of Bengal. Right. So he was uh, in the position of Governor General of Bengal uh, from 1772 to 85. So we can say it is a very long, considerably long period of time. Right. So uh, accomplishments or we can say important happenings during his uh, tenure. He laid the foundation along with Robert Clive, Warren Hastings, Warren Hastings believed, believed to have laid the foundation of British uh, Empire or we can say especially East India Company in India. Right. He took many administrative reforms like reforms in civil services, ref reforms in judiciary and also in tax collection, uh, revenue collection also. We will see each of those reforms and uh, he is also involved in wars with the native rulers and uh, he achieved some success especially during the Maratha wars. In the first and second Maratha wars, he played a very peculiar, uh, important role, a decisive role and the British India could see victory or sorry, the East India Company could see victory uh, because of his prominent role. So if we see the administrative reforms of uh, Warren Hastings, he abolished the dual system. So you know very well, after the Battle of Baksar, Battle of Baksar, uh, Robert Clive introduced a system that is known as effectively known as dual system or dual government or somehow uh, some in some terms like diarchy also we call we call it. So effectively this system is tax collection uh, the responsibility responsibility or the right to collect the tax has been taken away by the Britishers. So British used to collect the tax however the Nawab the Nawab of Bengal, he was given the duty of ruling or uh, overseeing the administration, day-to-day -day administration of Bengal. So, this is known as a uh, diarchy or dual government or dual rule. So, <coughs> people have vexed with this system. Uh, effectively, this dual system uh, has led to famine in the Bengal because Britishers were collecting all the taxes. However, the responsibility to oversee the welfare of the people has uh, given to the Sultan or Nawab, Nawab of Bengal. The Nawab of Bengal, he did not have the resources to spend for the welfare of the people. So, people hated this system, we can say. People hated this system, dual system. So, uh, Warren Hastings realized this aspect. The, I mean, when Robert Clive was introducing uh, his syst this system, uh, his main motive or his single motive was to increase the 
increase the revenues for the company you know he is a very money minded person he is uh, known for corruption etc all these things you know uh, uh, i mean he is known for his cunning uh, i mean cunning nature and uh, very uh, clever nature so with all these things he brought in this system he cleverly brought in this system just he had taken the right to collect uh, collect the taxes and uh, the entire administration burden he simply left to the nawab so uh, warren hastings he realized this problem and uh, he abolished the dual system right so in this way he brought the direct uh, he brought the bengal under the direct uh, administrative control of the east india company apart from that he also established the board of revenue to streamline and oversee the revenue collection uh, in the main uh, or revenue collection and management of areas of uh, that are there in the bengal apart from that he also brought in some land revenue reforms first uh, he introduced a five year fixed fixed land revenue settlement that is also known as the quinquennial settlement of 1772 however it was failed and it has to be withdrawn after that he also brought another system uh, that is collection of revenue through the intermediaries in indian intermediaries those are known as collectors so you should uh, remember one thing that the pre- present uh, nomenclature especially this nomenclature is uh, popular in south indian states uh, collectors collector right so uh, when you become the uh, when you clear civils and become is officer so you will be aspiring to be appointed as a collector uh, at least once in your lifetime so once you complete your service i think in between 4 4 to 6 years uh, you will be uh, appointed as the collector collector and deputy magistrate so <coughs> so that roots of that are there that position are there in the uh, the position created by warren hastings at that time so they were collecting taxes at that time right apart from that he also introduced the several judicial reforms like the zamindars at that time they were having the judicial power also so they were convicting the people for the crimes so uh, he has taken away the judicial power of the zamindars and he established a hierarchy of courts like uh, district courts to sardar diwani adalats these are appellate courts and uh, uh, these courts have been established in kolkata or calcutta uh, for the purpose of civil and criminal cases respectively right he also attempted to codify the hindu law so these are some of his uh, reforms or we can say administrative reforms taken by warren hastings also reduction in nawab's uh, allowance so he also reduced the allowance of the nawab uh, the bengal nawab of bengal was receiving right so we can say he had laid a very good foundation whatever may be his ambitions like uh, grabbing the territory of india so those things are there but whatever the initiatives taken by him like creating separate courts for judiciary creating a separate mechanism for tax collection etc so all these were in the coming future they have grown by leaps and bounds and we can say a well structured administrative system has been established in india because of him only because of warren hastings right so uh, this is the contribution of warren hastings however uh warren hastings has been alleged with corruption in india so there was a uh, uh once he went uh, went back to england so he has to face a lengthy and expensive impeachment uh trial for his alleged corruption in india so in the end he was acquitted uh, of of the charges but however his image has tarnished very much due to that particular trial so this is about warren hastings next is lord cornwallis he is also one of the prominent governor generals of bengal right so he was governor general he was go- governor general between 1786 to 1793 right 
so he was involved in anglo mysore war so because of his tactic tactics and uh, military we can say acumen uh, he was able to defeat tipu sultan tipu sultan in third anglo mysore war right we can say we uh, we cannot exactly say tipu sultan was defeated in the third battle of mysore we can say they have in the end they have come to an agreement so there was a settlement between the two powers however lord cornwallis played an important role in that so apart from that he introduced the uh, cornwallis code in 19 sorry 1793 that is a permanent land revenue system known as the permanent uh, that is known as the permanent settlement so he fixed the land revenue rate for a period of 10 years with this he killed theoretically brought stability and predictability for both both zamindars and the british east india company so with this what happened the british east india company eic had a fair idea that how many how much of the revenue is going to come in the next 10 years so zamindars ha- have also had a fair idea that what is going to be their income tax collection in the coming na- 10 years so with this kind some kind of stability has been brought into the tax collection system apart from that he also introduced some judicial ru- uh, reforms uh, he separated the revenue administration from the judiciary aimed at improving the justice system and reducing corruption so this also his contribution other contributions are he suppressed the corruption because at that time the east india company is known for huge corruption they were taking huge corruption at one side east india company was making losses uh, and the officials of east india company who were associated with east india company especially in india they were becoming richer and richer they were becoming very very rich so i mean the east india company had to take measures to address this issue so because of that reason also regulating ha- for the very purpose the regulating act has been brought in and uh, lord cornwallis he also contributed for the suppression of corru- corruption in the east india company right also he tried to regulate the company army right so he worked for improving and uh, training uh, and maintaining discipline within the east india company's sepoys right so his contributions if you see he contributed for the permanent settlement right uh, he reformed the judicial system and also he uh, contributed in consolidating british power in india right lord wellesley next prominent uh, governor general of bengal so he was governor general between 1798 to 1805 right so he is known for his aggressive expansionist policies uh, we know very well about him uh, so he is very well known for his uh, interaction of this system the subsidiary allegiance uh, sorry alliance system right he actively pursued the territo- ambitions of territorial expansion in some pretext or the other by wa- by means of war or by means of alliance he wanted to gain control over the indian territories this was his whole whole and soul ambition so with that only he brought in the subsidiary alliance system so briefly if we, if we see the features of the subsidiary alliance system are uh, the territories who are signing or the the native kingdoms princely states which are signing the subsidiary alliance system uh, with the british government they have to maintain british army forces within the territories within the princely states and the expenditure will be met by met by the same prince same princely state apart from that sever or end diplomatic ties with other european powers especially at the time france was uh, giving huge competition competition to britishers so they targeted uh, wellesley targeted the france officials and uh, he uh, said that princes who are signing the subsidiary ally alliance with the britishers they have to sever all diplomatic relations with other european powers next they have to accept the british british protection in exchange for surrendering some control over their foreign policy and apart from that 
the british uh, britishers or east india company will appoint a british officer in the court of that princely state he will be known as the resident he will be known as the resident and he will be giving his opinion and advice to the prince over the administrative issues especially over the foreign policy right so these are the features of subsidiary alliance so impact of the subsidiary alliance you know very well at the end of the day the britishers had indirect control over the princes right so effectively it weakened the military powers and uh, increased the british influence in the administration of the princely states right right so effectively it also led to increased the financial burden on the indian states resentment among the indian rulers who felt like puppets and the potential for conflict when rulers resisted british demands so all these things have happened other policies if you see he implemented administrative reforms to improve tax collection and strengthen british administration he also attempted to modernize the british army and introduced new military technologies right so he also uh, patronized scholarship and learning he also established the fort william college in calcutta to study indian languages and culture especially he wanted to train british officers uh, in the ways of indian system so that they can come and work at high places in indian administrative system so because of that reason he established the college of fort william at calcutta right so this is a very very important point please try to remember that so this is about wellesley next important uh, governor gen uh, governor general is lord hastings so uh, he is known for his military victories especially in two wars that is anglo anglo nepalese war fought between 1814 to 1816 right so uh, following the border disputes and concerns about gurkha expansionism this particular war has been waged by lord hastings right so securing a victory on gurkhas he forced nepal to cede some territories and establish diplomatic relations with india next is the third anglo maratha war so uh, the marathas uh, a powerful confeder confederacy in india they were posing threats to british uh, empire so by the uh, third maratha war the he was able to control the maratha power right right so the doctrine of, he also proposed the doc, doctrine of paramountcy right so it was a new policy introduced by hastings that asserted british supremacy over all indian states both princely states and the areas under i mean the states or territories that are there under subsidiary alliances right so he uh, said that the british are the ultimate authority to intervene in the internal affairs of indian states and could dictate their foreign policy so especially i mean this is the essence of doctrine of paramountcy that is uh, we can say promulgated by lord hastings so impact if we see uh, it justified intervention in indian states affairs discouraging any potential alliances against the british and laying the groundwork for further annexation of indian territories however it is also criticized for being an uh, arrogantly uh, arrogant policy leading to resent resentment among indian rulers who felt their autonomy was undermined and the potentially creating instability by interfering in the internal uh, issues of princely states right so other initiatives he has uh, started some public work projects like building roads bridges and canals to improve communication and trade within india education also towards education also uh, he supported educational initiatives including the founding of the hindu college in calcutta right we aim to promote western education in india right so these were the governor generals of bengal governors general of bengal now we will study about the governors general of india 
so lord william bentinck he was the first governor general of india right so his governorship was between 1828 to 1838 so social reforms he is very well known for his contribution towards social reforms so along with raja ramohan rai he uh, brought in the abolition of sati by bringing a act sati abolition act of 1829 right next is suppression of female infanticide and the human sacrifice especially the practice of human sacrifice it was going on in the tribes some tribes in odisha so he also tried to prevent that and uh, he also uh, tried to suppress the female inf- infanticide right uh, regulation of slavery he restricted the slave trade within british india and implemented measure to improve the conditions of existing slaves educational reforms he tried to anglicize the education in india right so he introduced english as the medium of instruction in higher education so he wanted to create a class of indians familiar with the western knowledge and administration uh, this policy however had limitations as it neglected traditional indian languages and educational systems right so he also contributed somewhat towards the financial reforms in the country so legacy if you observe he is known as a social reformer in india he uh, i mean he promoted english education in india neglecting indian education uh, this is his legacy right so next is lord dalhousie so <coughs> right lord dalhousie he is also we can say is a controversial figure uh, his uh, ambition was also to grab or gain control over indian territories uh, in some pretext or the other so <coughs> Uh, we will see his governorship between 1848 to 1856 so lord large uh, lord dalhousie he is uh, can, he can be considered as the major person for 1857 revolt in india so but that time uh, when actually revolt has happened 18 1857 so that time he may not be the governor general but because he was i mean before the revolt before the outbreak of revolt he was taking all the decisions uh, for whatever the measures he has has taken by him that were responsible for the break out of 1857 revolt right so uh, he was uh, i mean we can say is the example of we can say imperialism somehow or the other he wanted to grab the indian territories by whatever the pretext it may be right so because of that reason only the 1857 revolt broke out so doctrine of lapse he brought in the doc- doctrine of lapse so this policy declared that any indian ruler who is not with a legitimate successor so the british uh, uh, the east india company if it wants it can take control of that particular kingdom so that was the uh we can say rule set up by the doctrine of locks so uh, under that pretext he grabbed many kingdoms like satara jansi and nagpur so uh, dalhousie aggressively used this policy to annex several indian kingdoms so some of the examples are given so earlier also this uh, law law was there doctrine of lapse uh, i mean the theory is called as the doctrine of lapse there is a legal mechanism there was a law behind this uh, doctrine so earlier also the law was there but earlier governor generals they were not that enthusiastic to impose or use this law doctrine but however lord dalhousie chose to act upon this doctrine right so be, i mean apart from that he also annexed punjab in 1849 so following the anglo sikh war so six were very uh, i mean uh, for most of period of the time the six were maintaining good relations with the east india company but however uh, after the second anglo with the anglo second anglo sikh war dalhousie annexed the punjab in the british india right next he also ordered the un- conquest and annex- annexation of lower burma in 1850 right 
so uh, what is the impact of his uh, policy of expansion though uh, the annexation significantly increased the british territory in india also consolidated their power however the doctrine of lapse as i was uh, telling earlier it is a very highly controversial law right so it was seen by many indian rulers as a blatant attempt to exploit a technic uh, technicality to seize power over their territories right so this fueled the resentment and uh, contributed to the revolt by the indians right so i was uh, telling about a question in the mains so all the lord dalhousie is known for is a territorial expansion i mean land grabbing policy however a uh, few years back there was a question in the mains that how lord dalhousie can be considered as a uh, uh, modernizer with respect to india so he can be called as a modernizer of india because of the various measures though the intention was different the intention was not to modernize india the intention is other but however indirectly all those measures taken by him contributed to modernization in india the measures are like uh, he introduced a uniform system of postal stamps with this the communication has improved with a little bit amount of money we can send letters to uh, any part of the country so he introduced a uniform system of postal stamps and with that the communication within the entire india has made, has been made possible he also established a network of telegraphs uh, telegraph lines and railways significantly improving the communication and the transportation across the country also he reformed the education system introducing a more secular education so because of these reasons he is known as the modernizer of india all right so uh, this was the main question i was mentioning about right apart from that he also introduced the military reforms uh, he modernized the british indian army standardized weapons and the training also right other initiatives he also invested in irrigation projects and uh, he undertook uh, many irrigation projects increasing agricultural productivity next he also worked for suppression of female infanticide right so legacy if you see he is known as an expansionist in india however uh, his measures are uh, taken particular measures taken by him he also they also contributed for modernization of india next uh, lord canning another governor governor general of india so during his time the sepoy mutiny or the 1857 revolt 87 57 revolt has occurred so all the things about the uh, the 1857 revolt you know very well right so uh, he uh, i mean he was successful in the end to suppress the revolt 1857 revolt uh, he brought in a clemency policy right so he infamously advocated for a policy of modernization clemency planning uh, clemency planning to quell the rebellion and prevent further bloodshed this policy while intended to avoid excessive retribution against rebels so this is uh, uh, actually this policy uh, somewhat favors indians but it was this policy is criticized by britishers in Brit britain however this policy clemency policy that is known as clemency a uh, canning i mean it earned him the nickname that clemency canning so it favored indians but however this policy is criticized in britain right so what happened during this time the rule of the british east india company has come to an end and the territories of india uh, have been directly uh, taken over under uh, taken over under the control of the british crown right so after that reorganization of the army has also taken place so the percentage of britishers in the indian army has been greatly increased right other contributions so uh, he contributed in establishing universities right so universities at calcutta madras and bombay so where the three major centers of britishers were there right so also the 
uh, so Woods Dispatch, which is considered as the Magna for Magna Carta of Education in India. So it is also dispatched based on the recommendations of Charles, uh, his recommendations only. It is aimed at promoting Western style education in India. So remember this one, Woods Dispatch. It has happened during the time of canning only. Also, he has contributed to infrastructure development like irrigation canals, uh, right, and the railway networks. So this is about Governor Generals of India. Now we will see Vice Rice after 1857 revolt. Uh, we have already uh, we know already the British uh, Indian territories have directly been taken uh, under the control of British Crown. Uh, the prince, uh, however, after the 1857 uh, revolt, the policy of annexation of the British uh, has also come to an end. So by uh, by that time, they have decided that no further uh, no Indian territories will further be annexed by British uh, Britishers. So thus, uh, that assurance has been given to princely states. So whenever the Governor General was interacting with the princely princely states. He was uh, his de designation was known as the vice right, right. So after that, uh, he is alternatively that person who is holding that position he is alternatively alternatively known as the vice right or the governor general of India, right. So Lord Mayo, his uh, vice royship was between 1869 and 1872. So he is known for his reforms regarding the local administration local administration so along with the ripon lord mayo is known as the father of local uh, local administration in india because of various measures taken by him to give some sort of autonomy to local administration in india right so uh, administration he his major focus was on administration and development so unlike the other viceroys uh, who were priori prioritizing military conquest, he, Lord Mayo, concentrated on administrative reforms and educational development. Right. So, he focused on decentralization of finances. Right. So, he empowered provincial governments with a greater control over things like budget. Right. Infrastructure development, he promoted construction of railways, irrigation canals, and public work projects also have been taken by him. Promotion of education. He advocated for promotion and spread of primary education among Indians. He also established Mayo College at Ajmer to educate Indian princes in politics and administration. So this is a very, very good step. Other initiatives, if you see, famine relief, he to, uh, took steps to prepare uh, for uh, prepare for and mitigate the impact of famines uh, which was a recurring problem during the British rule in India. So because of the expand or we can say exploitative policies of Britishers, famine was a recurring problem in India. So many people used to die because of the famines at that time. So Lord Mayo has taken steps to prevent famines in India. Foreign policy he pursued a non-interventionist foreign policy focusing on internal consolidation and uh, rather than external expansion. Right. So he strengthened ties with Afghanistan's Emir Sheikh Ali Khan. Right. So if his legacy, if we see uh, administrative reforms, education, and uh, uh, I mean, unfortunately, his uh, tenure has ended abruptly because uh, he was assassinated by Sher al Afridi, a designated Afghan convict on the Andaman Islands. So, unfortunately, he was assassin assassinated, assassinated by this convicted criminal. Right. Next is uh, Lord Lytton. So, Lord Lytton, he is uh, known for his reactionary policies in India. Reactionary policies. So all the measures taken by him were reactionary only. So he wanted to punish the Indians in some way or the other. He is also known for his racist feelings. Racist feelings. So he believed that Indians are inferiors 
when compared to Britishers. He felt that Britishers are a superior race, and because of that, they have the right to rule over Indians. So he came with this mentality to India, and all the measures taken by him uh, suggest and give strength to strength to uh, his belief that they are a superior race and uh, indians are only fit to be ruled by others right so he is the controversial policy if you see the vernacular press act 18 uh, 1878 so it was a uh, i mean foremost in the reactionary policies taken by uh, viceroy viceroy lord lytton so in that uh, at that time the uh, local i mean the press that is published in the local languages vernacular they were known as at that time vernacular languages uh, they are local languages like malayalam telugu tamil punjabi etc so uh, the because the britishers do not know this language they were these uh, press uh, or the newspapers published in these languages languages they were promoting nationalism they were preaching against the britishers so he uh, viceroy lytton he wanted to control that so he kind of imposed a strict sen- uh, censorship on the strictest censorship on these newspapers so once it comes to know that the vernacular press is uh, preaching against uh, the british rule in india the entire press equipment used to be seized by the governor generals and uh, each and every he also put uh, rules like that each and every article published in the Verna- vernacular language first it has to get permission uh, permission from the british authorities after that only that articles have to be published so the restrictions were very very severe uh, that were imposed by lord lytton so uh, because of that reason this act come to be uh, hugely criticized by the indians not only Indi- indians even the britishers even the europeans uh, themselves have criticized this act because of the huge censorship right so it uh, they resemble as the black days dark days so that was the severity of this particular act vernacular uh, press act right so it allowed the government the act allowed the government to restrict the publication of material deemed seditious or inflammatory so this act was seen as a curb on the freedom of expression and uh, generated significant criticism not only among the indians but also even in the europeans also he laid wars or he waged wars on afghanistan so his aggressive foreign policy towards afghanistan led to the second anglo afghan war in 1878-80 so this war uh, proved very costly and uh, inconclusive and uh, lord lytton has to face we can say severe criticism because of his expansionist i mean we can say his policy or war against afghan was a uh, failure huge failure not simple failure huge failure he faced lot of criticism because of this afghan war also because the entire cost or we can say war expenditure is borne by borne from the indian treasury only so entire war war was waged with the indian cost or uh, indian expenditure only so he, instead of spending on the welfare of the people he chose to wage war on afghanistan however that also resulted in a huge finance i mean uh, huge failure it was a huge failure right right he also uh, brought some administrative changes he introduced uh, administrative changes like increased the revenue demands and the demon demonetization of silver also done by him which caused economic hardship hardship for many indians also the great famine has occurred during his time only during the period of 1876 to 1878 <coughs> all right so a devastating famine struck during the period of lytton's viceroyalty right so some argue that the government's response at that time was inadequate others acknowledge that the challenges of maintaining such large scale crisis so however we can say his response is uh, i mean famine was occurring 
at that time however lord lytton chose to ignore that uh, we can say <coughs> that uh, farming on the other hand he was adamant on uh, conducting this delhi darbar so it was held amidst a severe famine famine was raging the country uh, and uh, during that time he chose to conduct this delhi darbar so lytton organized a grand delhi darbar to proclaim queen victoria as kaiser e hind that is empress of india uh, while right so while he intended to show cause the i mean show cause the british monarch's power on india at another side uh, the famine famine was raging the country so the indian national congress at that time was also choose to uh, respond very uniquely so no indian uh, want i mean the indian co- national congress the, uh, declared that no indian should participate in this uh, whatever delhi darbar has uh, conducted by viceroy uh, viceroy lytton right so his legacy is he is a controversial figure famine management he chose not to respond to the famine so because of millions of millions have indians have died at the same time he chose to conduct delhi darbar which was a huge expenditure on the uh, indian exchequer apart from that he also chose to uh, i mean he waged a war on afghanistan which proved very very costly right so this is about lord lytton so all his reactionary policies have been somewhat taken away by uh, ripon so because of his compassion because of the compassionate rule of lord ripon he is known as the ripon the good so he also like mayo concentrated on the good governance and he wanted to see the welfare of indians so most of the reactionary initiatives that have been started by lord R- uh, lord lytton that have been taken back by lord R- uh, lord ripon uh, started the reactionary policies and most of those policies have been taken back by lord ripon so most of the uh, his uh, we can say contributing uh, factors in india are repeal uh, repeal of vernacular press act so ripon has uh, repealed the vernacular press act because of the severe restrictions placed by that uh, placed by that act on the vernacular press also uh, he reformed the local self governments he is considered as the father of the local self governments in india right so he initiated a policy of local self government he aimed at decentralizing power and uh, giving indians a greater say in local administration other reforms he also contributed to educational reforms that encouraged education for girls and uh, supported technical education also economic reforms he focused on reducing government spending and uh, improving agricultural practices to alleviate poverty gilbert bill so it is a good initiative in the context of india so here uh, whenever a european also uh, involves uh, the Il- ilbert bill uh, that uh, it said that indian judges can also uh, we can say uh, give judgments on the british uh, britishers so this was the Il- ilbert bill so he brought in the ilbert bill however the europeans especially the britishers who were there in india they opposed this bill ilbert bill that i mean the inferior indians cannot rule over as cannot give judgments about uh, i mean on us that was the argument of the britishers so however the uh, lord ripon wanted to go along with the bill and he supported the bill so this uh, move was seen as promoting equality before law whether it was indians or the britishers however it was opposed by uh, britishers right so in the end after ripon the bill was actually withdrawn because of the opposition from the britishers in india so uh, challenges to his ap- administration so ripon's progressive policies it faced the resistance from within the british administration in india so they don't want the they do not wanted uh, the welfareist measures taken by ripon to be continued so they themselves criticized ripon right so uh, because of the controversy surrounding the ilbert bill only he had to resign from his position in 1884 right 
so this is uh, his contribution so because of his very good initiatives he is known as dir uh, he is given the title or he was known as ripan the good so this is about ripan right so lord karjan he was the governor general or we can say viceroy between 1899 to 1905 so he is known for the partition of bengal so he was the brain behind the partition of bengal so you know what is the result of the partition of bengal so the vandai matra movement uh, has seen or that is also known as the anti uh, partition movement so it was the first mass based movement in india and we can say it is a watershed watershed period in the uh, indian national movement so uh, <coughs> so uh, his controversial policies the first policy is the partition of bengal apart from that he also taken some measures like or uh, i mean <coughs> he uh, worked for archaeological preservation he also established the archaeological survey of india so presently also we have this archaeological survey of india you know it very well he was the i mean person behind establishment of this one also he focused on improving famine relief measures learning from the mistakes of previous farmers so because of these reasons uh, these efforts also the famine code has come famine code so when you uh, study in detail about the british policies you will also study about the famine code so basically famine code is nothing but whenever a famine occurs how to take care of the people with with a less expenditure with less cost so they wanted to control famine with the least cost so it is also kind of reactionary policy only uh, that because of that it faced criticism also so they want to spend little money even during the time of famine and they want to control the famine right apart from that he also took some efficiency measures like separation of judiciary from the executive branch streamlining the financial procedures and the est- establishment of a police commission to improve police practices policing practices so these are his measures right apart from that he also uh, took some educational reforms like he he emphasized, emphasized the classical education over technical and vocal training uh, they were criticized by indians so because he was emphasizing on the traditional education right so this is about uh, lord uh, lord karjan so main role main uh, mainly you will study about him when you study the vande mataram movement next uh, governor general or we can say vice prime is lord irwin so so irwin he is very much associated with the civil disobedience movement so civil disobedience movement so when you study the civil uh, disob- uh, disobedience movement and the gandhian era you will be covering uh, in detail about lord irwin so lord irwin he is known for his pact with gandhi ji that pact pact is famously known as the gandhi irwin pact so you will study about the minor details in the pact when you study the civil disobedience movement right so major uh, development during his period is that is occurrence of uh, civil disobedience movement and uh, after that after uh, civil dis- disobedience movement has been temporarily temporarily halted by gandhi ji and he chose to participate in the round table conferences so during his uh, the time period of lord irwin only the three round table conferences have been taken place right so the last governor general or viceroy of india uh, he is uh, or we can say the last governor general effectively is lord mountbatten right so he was there in india for a brief period of time so during this time only uh, his time only india has achieved independence and also india has been partitioned all right so uh, everything you know he his plan is uh, famously known as the mount barton uh, mount barton accord or the dicky bird plan so he, there he proposed partition of india so partition of india has been proposed by him and it is also practically implemented so after that india has achieved independence so few months after up- achievement of independence also mount barton has been continued as the governor general of india and after that uh, he has uh, i mean he resigned and uh, c rajgopala uh, c rajgopalachari appointed as the governor general of india right 
so this he is uh, basically this is his contribution so when you study indian history modern indian history uh, during the period i mean occurrence of uh, independence and uh, partition of india you will study in detail about him all right so he is legacy if you see he is criticized for his hasty partition policy and uh, <coughs> uh, also he is credited for avoiding further violence because he proposed the partition plan so there at that time communal rights were taking place uh, the muslim league chose to uh, resort for violence etc all these things you know very well so this is uh, briefly his legacy right so now we will see few questions uh, that are asked from this topic so the question first question it is asked in 2020 question is wellesley established the fort william college in calcutta because the options given are various options are given so the correct correct option is option d that is he wanted to train british civilians for administrative purpose in india so that was the motive the correct option is option d next question is it is also asked in 2020 question is the gandhi irwin pact included which of the following so statements are invitation to congress to participate in the round table conference so second round table conference the congress has actually participated the in the first round table conference the civil disobedience movement mo movement was going on so congress chose not to participate in that so first statement is a correct statement second one is withdrawal of ordinances promulgated in connection with the civil disobedience movement yes this is also correct statement accent acceptance of gandhi ji's suggestions for inquiry into police excesses so gandhi ji made his uh, this uh, uh, we can say proposal put this proposal in the pact but this has not been accepted uh, in the uh, this this not been accept, accepted by irwin so it is not part of the final accord concluded by both of them gandhi ji and irwin next is release of only those prisoners who were not charged with violence so this is also correct statement only those prisoners were released who were not charged with violence so this is also correct statement so correct option is option b one two statements one two four are correct right so this is it uh, for today thank you thank you for joining the class see you next time until then have a good day